today, but it is great to be with you and just be a part of our worship today. And I, I do, I hope that uh, you've just had an encounter with the Lord through our worship of Him. And we're going to study His Word for the next uh, half an hour or so and hopefully just glean some knowledge from what God wants us to hear. Now, we're in that 16th chapter of the Gospel of John. We're in the home stretch now. There's just, uh, just a few more chapters to go, and then we'll finish our study. We started this study off by, by naming it Life in His Name. And if you'll remember that next to the last chapter in the book of John, John says, many other signs and miracles Jesus performed, but these are written. He said, the ones that he performed, he said, we didn't write everything down. We didn't list everything. He said, they're not recorded in this book, but these are written. The ones that we've looked at up to this point, these are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And by believing, you will have life in his name. And that's what Jesus wants for us, to believe in him to the point that it's going to change our life, that we're going to not just believe in him, but obey what he's taught us to do. And starting in the 13th chapter of John, we've been in this, what a lot of theologians will call the upper room discourse. It is the talk that Jesus has with his disciples right before his arrest. So starting in chapter 13, Jesus starts telling them some things that they need to be aware of. He teaches them what a real servant in the kingdom of God looks like. The one who is willing to serve everyone else is the greatest in the kingdom. And he says, you need to be like this. You need to serve others. Then he instituted for us the Lord's Supper. The communion that we celebrated today was instituted in that chapter. And he started telling them, I'm doing all of this because I'm going to be handed over. They're going to put me on trial and I'm going to be killed. We remember Peter standing up and said, no, Lord, no, no, I'm not going to let anything happen to you. I'd give my life for you. And Jesus said, would you give your life for me? This very night before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. The disciples, as they were hearing all of this bad news, it starts off that they were concerned. That's how John writes it. Then he says they were afraid. And now we get to chapter 16. And Jesus continues to be very truthful with them of what's in the future for them. And we read that they are filled with sorrow. Would you turn with me to that 16th chapter? And let's read the first seven verses together. Starting uh, again in chapter 16, Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Jesus said, I didn't tell you about these things at the beginning of my ministry because I've been with you. I've been with you through every storm, through every trial, through every time they tried to, to do harm to us. I've been with you. But he said, it's not going to be like that after tonight. Things are about to change. He says, but now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, Sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now Jesus tells us that some bad times are coming. He tells his disciples, they're going to kick you out of the synagogue. And to the, to the Jew, that was one of the worst things that could happen. That affected you not just in your uh, relationship with worship and the Lord. It affected you financially because people wouldn't do business with you any longer if you were excommunicated from the synagogue. But Jesus said it's going to be worse than that. 
The time's coming when they're going to kill you and they're going to think they're doing God's work. Boy, some bad times. And he says, now that I've told you this, I know your heart is filled with sorrow. But I'm telling you these things so that when they happen, you will have known that I knew it was coming and I warned you so that you could be prepared and that you'll stay strong. But he says, it's to your advantage that I go away. Now, I think that that's, that was puzzling to them. It's to your advantage that I go away. And these words were recorded by the inspiration of God's Spirit for us today. It was not just for those disciples. The advantage for us today is the same. Now, it's hard to understand because they had Jesus with them. How many times have you thought in your own life, boy, if I, just, if I could just talk to Jesus, if I could just walk with him just for a few minutes, if I could just ask him some questions, man, that would be great. That would be, that'd be just answered prayers. They had Jesus with them. But Jesus said, it's, it's to your advantage that I'm not going to be with you anymore. Why would that be? He says, so that the helper will come. The helper is the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason why it was to their advantage and the reason why it's to our advantage is that Jesus in that day was doing an earthly ministry. He could only be one place at a time. He was in the body. He was only with the disciples um, part of the time, and then he would go away and find a private place to pray, and they'd be on their own for a few minutes, but he would come back to them, and they could walk to the next town and be with him. But they had him with them, but he said, it's better that I'm not going to be here because then the helper will come. The helper is the Holy Spirit who comes to all believers when they truly believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They repent of their sin, and they're obedient to him. In Christian baptism, as we see in the second chapter of the book of Acts, where Peter was the one who preached that Pentecostal sermon and said 3,000 people were saved that day, if we will go back and look at that, Peter baptized them for the forgiveness of their sins and what? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, the helper, the comforter, the counselor, he's got many names, but he was given to us when we became Christians. He was the one who makes us righteous before the Lord. And we have him with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year. 365 days a year, he is with those who are in him, who are in Christ. And Jesus said, it's to your advantage that you have the Holy Spirit with you all of this time. You're going to need him for the days to come. And so he tells us about this helper, this Holy Spirit. And I want to pause right there in Jesus' teaching to just teach a few minutes on what we know as the Trinity. Because the 16th chapter of John is a beautiful chapter that, that really just brings out the, the Holy Spirit. In our worship, in our time of walking with the Lord, I'm going to be very truthful with you. The Holy Spirit gets the short end of the stick many times, doesn't he? The Holy Spirit is, is a, an entity just like God the Father, just like Jesus the Son. The Holy Spirit is a person who is to be revered. He is a, a part of the Trinity of God, which is represented on that little stained glass up there. Many of you who've got bad eyesight say, well, they got a stirring wheel up on the church for it. That's not a stirring wheel. In the center of that stained glass, in that very center circle is God. And then you have the Father connected to that. Then you have the Son connected to that. And then you have the Holy Spirit connected to that. And so often, We'll just give praise and honor to God, and rightfully so. Never mistake that. You can't give too much praise and honor and glory to God. And we will give praise and honor to Jesus, our, our Savior, and rightfully so. Once again, you cannot give too much praise and glory and honor to Jesus for what he's done for us. 
But the Holy Spirit is the one that Jesus said is going to be our counselor, to be our comforter. And I'm here to tell you that the Trinity is, is very hard to comprehend. There have been many analogies that people have given over the years to try to, try to give us a, a picture of the Trinity. And all the analogies given are bad. But I've heard things like water. Water's like the Trinity because water comes in three forms. You've got the liquid, the solid, like in ice, and you've got the vapor, like in the clouds. I've heard illustrations used of like an egg. You've got the shell, you've got the yolk, and then you've got the, the white, the egg white. I've heard illustrations of the clover where you've got three separate parts of that uh, clover leaf, but it's all one. I've heard the sun being used because you've got the sun, that star, that ball of hydrogen that's on fire, and then you've got the light that it emits, and then you've got the heat. All of those are terrible analogies of the Holy Spirit. Now, I can't give you an analogy of the Holy Spirit. The Trinity, uh, I can't give you an analogy of the Trinity because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit can't be comprehended by human reason. It can only be understood by faith. We worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity. I know that's confusing to you, but that's the way it is. We don't want to confuse the person by dividing the substance. We're, we're really compelled by Christian truth to confess this, that each of those are distinct persons. They're distinct persons who are God and Lord. And that the deity of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. And Jesus tells us here that the Holy Spirit is going to come to you. He is going to send the Spirit to us. And I think it'd be very beneficial for us here today to take a few minutes and just see what the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit does. Because he's so important, we don't want to overlook his ministry. The, the ministry of the Holy Spirit starts with he's helping the righteous those who are in Christ. That is one of the paramount things that Jesus says the Holy Spirit is going to do. He's going to help us who are the believers. Now, how does he do that? Well, just by the sheer dynamic of his name, he encourages us. He comforts us. He really brings peace to our life. That's why Jesus calls him the helper, the comforter. That's what he's going to do for you. And if you have the Holy Spirit in you, if you are truly Christian, then that's one of the things that he is going to do for you. Also, he teaches and guides us. Look at verse 13 for a moment with me. In verse 13, Jesus is uh, talking to the disciples about the work of the Holy Spirit, and he says these words. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. The Holy Spirit teaches us and he guides us. Much like a steering wheel on a car guides that car in the direction it's to go. The Holy Spirit guides a person's life like that. He teaches us what God wants out of our life, and he encourages us to follow that. Now, if you were driving your car somewhere that you had never been before, you've got two options. One, you can get a map, and you can look at that map and find your destination, and you can look at the roads that you need to take that's going to get you to, from point A, where you are now, to point B, where you want to go. And you can follow that. Many of you have maps on your phones that you use, GPS systems 
That's one way to get to your destination. Or you can go with someone who has already been there before. You can go with someone who knows the way. And friends, I think that that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He already knows the way to where we want to go. And in our life, we ought to let him be the driver. You've heard the old saying, God is my co-pilot, right? You've heard that before? Well, if you feel like God is your co-pilot, you need to switch seats. <laughs> Truly. You know, God should be your pilot, right? Because he knows what's ahead. He knows what's coming. So God, through the Holy Spirit, is inside of us to guide us in the paths that we should go. And if we'll listen, if we'll simply slow down enough to listen to his leading, he will direct us in those paths. He also communicates God's instruction to us. But there's something else that he does. I think it's important in the, in the life of the righteous in us. He brings glory to Jesus. Look at that 14th verse. Jesus said, he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. The work of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus, to bring honor to his name. And in our life, that should be what our life is about, to bring glory to Jesus, who's our Savior. And through the Holy Spirit, we can do that. There's a couple of other things that's in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He convicts the world of its sin. Jesus will tell us that in verse 8. He is, he's coming into the world and he's going to convict the world of its sin. He also reminds the godless of coming judgment. Again, that's in verse 8. Now friends, how does the Spirit work today? He works the same way that he worked in the day that Jesus was telling his disciples this. He works the same way as he did in that first century church. There's no wonder that the world doesn't want to hear what the true church of Jesus Christ has to say. Because when the message of the true church reaches out, the world is reminded of its sinfulness. Is there any, any um, reason why we can't understand why the world doesn't want to hear us speak out on moral issues? They want the church to just shut up and go away. And they will do that, try to make us be quiet in a, in a bunch of different ways. But the world doesn't want the church to be alive and active because it's going to be reminded of its sin. It's going to be reminded that there's coming judgment. No one wants to hear about judgment, do they? We want to avoid that. We don't even like talking about it or thinking about it. We don't like thinking about death because it's appointed once to man to die and then the judgment. We don't want to think about dying, do we? We don't even call it dying, do we? We say we, he passed away. Um, you know, we, we try to take away the sting of it, but it's coming for all of us. And the world doesn't want to hear anything about coming judgment, but that is what the Holy Spirit does. And how does it do that? Through the church. Through us, the church. Not that we're going out telling the world what we're against, but we should never be ashamed to tell the world what we're for. We're for God and his ways. The church is who the Holy Spirit of God uses to take his message out into the world today. And friends, if the gates of hell are prevailing against the church, it's because we have lost our power. Because we're not on fire anymore. We're, we're afraid, we're timid, we've been desensitized to sin. We don't, it doesn't bother us anymore. Sin needs to bother us, church. Being apart from God should bother us, and sin puts us apart from God. And so Jesus says the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to help you who are in Christ, but he's going to remind the world that there's a coming time. Satan has been judged. Jesus talks about that in that 8th and ninth verse. Satan has been judged. That's why he is under a curse now. He knows what's going to happen in the end. That's why he's ramping up his effort to try to tear down God's people. 
why he's trying to get so many people to align with him. And he's doing a good job at that, by the way. Satan is doing an excellent job at doing his job of destruction. The church is not doing such a good job at restoration. We need to ramp up our efforts to match our adversary's efforts. Because you see, every victory for Satan is a defeat for the church. Every victory for Satan means there is a potential brother or sister who's going to spend eternity apart from God one day in a place we call hell. And that should bother us. So we should get on fire and do what we need to do to have an impact in our community in our neighborhoods and in our homes. A person is either a child of God or a child of Satan. Now, worship is a lifestyle for us. We're, it's not reserved for this one hour that we're together. Worship should be a lifestyle for us. And Jesus really teaches us that we can, we can test our worship and see if the Holy Spirit's presence is in it. This morning, as we've gathered together for corporate worship, has the Holy Spirit been in this place? Now, I'm not talking about just an emotion. There are times I've heard people say, oh, man, I felt the Spirit of God move. It was so great, and I felt that. It's wonderful. But the, but the Holy Spirit is not just an emotion that we deal with. Emotions can change. They can change. Bill over there, Bill might say, man, today has been a good day. I've just felt the Spirit of God move. And he's, he gets up and he's talking to Janice as he's about to go out the door. And he says, man, what a good day. I feel the Spirit of the Lord. And then somebody lets that door shut and catches his fingers and mashes his fingers. Now that emotion is going to change pretty quickly, isn't it? Emotions are going to change. We can't base everything on emotion. But there's a test that we can see if the Holy Spirit is in our worship, has God been praised? Has God been lifted high in your worship? Maybe, let's, let's not take it corporate worship for men, just your lifestyle of worship. Is God praised in your lifestyle? Is Jesus glorified? That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's to bring glory to Jesus. Is Jesus glorified? Does the Word impact your life? The Word of God, if those things are not going on, then the Holy Spirit's not there. Because where the Holy Spirit is ministering, those things happen. I want to glorify God, don't you? I want to glorify the name of Jesus. I want to lift him high, not just for this one hour, but for a lifetime. It's wonderful. You know what it is? It's practice for what heaven's going to be like. Because when we get in heaven, we're going to glorify God, aren't we? We're going to worship. We're going to enjoy being together. We're, we're not going to want to leave. We're going to want to be there. Worship, corporate worship like we have this morning should be just like that. We shouldn't be looking at the clock and saying, man, it's 15 minutes to 12. We're going to be late for lunch. What are we going to do? We should say, Let's keep going. I want to hear more. I want to worship the Lord. Jesus tells us we need to do that. And just as the disciples needed the Holy Spirit, so we need him now more than ever before in our life because what's coming? Jesus is very truthful. He, he tells, tells the disciples a promise. I want you to turn with me to that 19th verse. Look at 19 through 20. Jesus says, I say to you that you will weep and lament. That doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? I say to you, you're going you're gonna to cry. You're going to sob. That's what lamenting means. You're just sorrowful. But the world will rejoice. The world's going to just keep on going. They're going to they're gonna just walk right past you laughing. And you will be sorrowful. Man, Jesus, that's not much of a pep talk. But there's a comma right after that word sorrowful. And then there's that word but. Man, I'm glad 
that that changes things. He said, the world's going to rejoice and you'll be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Your sorrow is going to be turned into joy. The same message is for you today, Christian, who are going through trials, going through difficult times. You're discouraged. The adversary has beaten you down. You are sorrowful. But God says, stick with me. And your sorrow will be turned to joy. And he says, therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice. And your joy, no one will take from you. You got to remember the setting here. Jesus was telling him, I'm about to die. I'm going to go away. Right now you're sorrowful, but you will see me again. And when you do, your sorrow will be replaced with joy, and then that joy no one's going to take away. Those disciples, just a few hours from now, are going to be hiding behind locked doors. But when they see the risen Jesus three days later, they went out from behind them locked doors to give their very life for the gospel message. They stood and they gave their life in so many ways, it's, it's terrible to think about what the first uh, apostles did. I mean, beheaded, having spears run through them, being crucified, being uh, just fed to wild animals, just pulled apart limb by limb. They did that because they knew that the best was ahead for them. Nothing could take away their joy, not being burned alive, not being dismembered. Nothing could take away their joy because they knew the best was to come. And Jesus teaches us something else. And I know we're late, but I want you to hear this. He teaches why we should pray in his name. Many of you will pray and you'll end your prayer in Jesus' name. That's wonderful. Why do you do that? Is it because some Sunday school teacher taught you that? Maybe you've just been around some godly people and they prayed like that, so you picked up the habit. Maybe your mom, dad taught you to pray. But you need to understand why we pray in Jesus' name. He tells us that in the 23rd and 24th verse. He said, and in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. He said, in this day to come, when the Holy Spirit comes into you, you're going to start praying in my name. You're going to start asking the Father what you need, and you're going to do it in my name. And whatever you ask for, the Father's going to give you so that your joy will be complete. Now, keep in mind, he's talking about the things we need. We're talking to the first century church, people who are facing persecution just because of being a Christian. Many of you say, well, I prayed and I wanted that new truck. I, you know, I don't want a Chevy Cavalier. I wanted a, a Beamer. I, I, I don't want a stinking S10. I wanted that, that full-size extended cab dually. It's not what you want that you ask for what you need. And when we ask in the name of Jesus, God's going to give us what we need. He's going to provide for us. So when we pray, we go to the very throne of grace, not on our standing, not because we deserve to be heard, but we go in the name of Jesus because he is the one who's made the way for us to be heard. And so it's by his name that we pray. And I think it's important for us to know. And in closing, I want to just look through the promises that Jesus gives us in the 16th chapter of John. Now, this isn't all of them. This isn't an exhaustive list. But this is the majority of those promises in John 16. And listen to them. Jesus will send the Holy Spirit to us. That's a promise. We will see Jesus again. That's a promise. Our sorrow will be turned to joy. That's a promise. Whatever we ask the Father for in Jesus' name, he will give us. That is also a promise. And we will have trials in this world. But Jesus 
has overcome the world. That's also a promise. So whatever you're going through in this life, I want you to listen to this last verse of the 16th chapter. As Jesus says to us, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. These things I've spoken to you that in, this, in, in me you're going to have peace. In the world, you'll have tribulation. You see the opposites there? In me, there's peace. In the world, there's trials, disappointments, discouragement. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world.